Hi, friends. I'm Luke, and I work at a company called HumbleSpark, where we do front-end consulting, including building stuff with Elm. Uh, I came down here from Chicago, and I know a lot of you in the audience today are here from Chicago, too. So thank you for being here. I'm super proud of the community that we're building out there, and I'm really excited to watch it grow. Um, so this is only a 20-minute talk, so I don't have like the 10 minutes that I originally planned to like wax poetic about how awesome it is to like be on this stage and talk to all of you. So instead, I'm just going to share a quote from, from our friend Richard Feldman that I think sums it up quite nicely. So that pretty accurately conveys how I feel about being up here and talking to you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about compilers as therapists. <laughs> so I think a bunch of people got the reference, but Evan wrote a blog post about the, the error messages that he introduced uh, titled Compilers as Assistants. And so I'm kind of piggybacking on that and taking it a little bit further and uh, trying to convey the idea that we can design tools so that people who experience life in some significantly different way than maybe the average programmer, uh, that those kind of people can be really productive and happy with the tools that they use and the things that they're building instead of having to try and fit in with the, with the rest of the folks. Uh, so for me, that means um, being able to build things effectively while having ADHD. And so I'm going to make this point with sort of four different things. Uh, so first, I need to share a disclaimer and tell you what I do and do not know about like brains and stuff. And based on the way I worded that, you can probably guess how much that is. <laughs> uh, then I need to kind of explain uh, what it means for me to have ADHD in a way that everybody can relate to uh, so that we can kind of get on the same footing. And then I'm just going to tell you a story about how I discovered Elm and how that's kind of changed uh, my experience and my kind of career trajectory as a programmer. And then it wouldn't be a good like, non-technical talk at a tech conference if I didn't give you all something to go and do afterwards. So that'll be the last thing. All right, so disclaimer. Um, I got super sidetracked when I was making this slide. I just love like web 1.0 clip art. So I really love the, the one all the way on the left with the person because it's like super meta because they're like pointing to the word disclaimer on a screen and I'm like literally doing the same thing. Um, <laughs> so anyway, okay, seri serious time now, serious time. Disclaimer, I'm totally not a psychologist. I have like no training whatsoever in psychology, so anything I say up here shouldn't be like construed as like a, you know, like a diagnostic recommendation or any, anything like that. Um, I don't know anything, and your doctor probably does. And like, please definitely don't ask me if I think you also have ADHD. That's a thing people do. And like, I really don't know, and your doctor would, so that's what you should do in that case. Um, so this talk is all 100% personal. I'm just here to like package up my experience and share, share it with my 230 new friends. And uh, so now I'm going to explain kind of what it's like for me personally having ADHD so you can kind of get inside my mind. So I'm going to compare it to poor eyesight. That's like a physical thing that people can kind of better picture. It's less abstract. So here is a list of symptoms that I've got off of this website, www.webmd.com, very reputable. <laughs> uh, eye strain is a, a symptom of poor vision. Fatigue uh, or headache if you're doing things. If you're farsighted, reading can uh, make you tired. It can give you a headache. If you're nearsighted, like reading the blackboard in school or looking at a, a screen like this can, can make you tired. It can, it can hurt, you, hurt your head. Uh, you have trouble focusing your vision on things. And generally, your vision is like blurry. And this can have some, some impact on your life. So when you have poor vision, you miss out on physical details of the world. You might not be able to appreciate uh, the, the beauty of a really fine piece of art. Uh, you might have trouble communicating in that you have a hard time reading signs or picking up on visual cues. And you might actually end up in physical danger. If you're doing something like driving, you can't see. You could get in an accident. Uh, so having poor eyesight can significantly impact your life. So now remember all those symptoms and how it affects people, and let's talk about my experience with ADHD. So it's uh, a mental kind of strain when things are hard to focus on. It's not quite boredom, per se. It's something more 
it's more physical than that, but it's still mental. It's hard to describe. Um, but again, fatigue and headache if you do concentration intensive tasks like reading. I haven't read a book uh, cover to cover since grade school. It's, it's really hard. Um, you have trouble focusing on the current activity. You have a hard time listening. Uh, in general, your thoughts are blurry. So if you can kind of imagine what it would be like to, to have blurry vision and make that more abstract and apply it to your mind, that's kind of how I experience the world. And so this can have similar kinds of effects. Uh, you miss out on mental and emotional details of your world. Uh, so it affects your relationships. You have a hard time communicating because it's hard to listen. It affects your work because you can have a hard time concentrating if the work isn't like fully engaging all the time. The tools you are using aren't keeping you on task. Uh, so there's good news for people with poor vision. We totally know how to help people with poor vision. Um, we use a lens to focus light. And the important aspect of this is that your eyes, when you put on a pair of glasses, are still the same. You're still the same visual self. Uh, it's just that you're using something to change the way you're experiencing the world. The light is being uh, bent in a particular way that works for you and it helps it to arrive at your rods and your cones correctly. So you have a really clear picture of everything that's going on, even though your eyes are the same. Uh, it turns out, I have found personally, that to help with ADHD, we can use tools to focus our thoughts. Uh, so it's the same kind of experience. And uh, for me, this tool has been, since I'm a user interface interested person, uh, this tool has been Elm. So now, uh, part three, I'm going to tell a story. So sometime toward the end of last year, I had this idea for a really cool side project. I was going to build it with, with React and Redux and some sort of uh, you know, local database like NEDB or, or uh, SQLite, and I was going to package it all up in Electron, and I was going to use like super cool Webpack things and CSS modules, all these technical decisions um, that I was excited about, but they ended up being uh, distractions. So I, I sat down to, to work on this project, and um, oh my. OK, cool. <laughs> Wow. Um, I sat down to work on the project, and something wasn't quite working with the data layer I was trying to use. And I, I was considering Falcor and GraphQL, and I built a, a Falcor router that worked over IPC and Electron and communicated with my database, and I open sourced that. And then I got interested in GraphQL because that was becoming interesting, and Relay had just come out. And I tried to do the same thing for GraphQL, and I like half finished that, and it didn't really work. It was terrible. Um, and not, not GraphQL, the thing that I built. Um, uh, and then, like, somehow I found some things that I didn't really like about how React CSS modules worked, and I went in and contributed to that project and, and made some changes there. And I even discovered this, this, like, misspelling bug deep down inside of Electron. And so this is, like, my one and only open source C++ commit that I'll ever do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I have this awesome like series of open source experiences, um, and I don't ever mean to express that ADHD is a bad thing because I wouldn't have ever done these things if I wasn't just like all over the place all the time. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make with all this is that I never built one single feature of that side project ever. Um, I didn't even create like a static mockup. So. Around the same time as I had made this commit, come on now, fine. <laughs> I discovered Elm, and since this is ElmConf, I don't need to go into too many of like the technical details of Elm. But the the general idea is that uh, Evans put all this time, and so many other people have, have contributed to making this super nice, uh, well thought out experience for building user interfaces. So you don't have to decide what kind of data structures you're going to use. They're just there. You don't have to decide when things are going to be mutable versus mutable. They're just there. Um, you don't need to decide like what paradigm everything's going to flow through and, and how many stores you have. It's all kind of taken care of. Uh, all of this to say that when you're building a package with Elm, when you're creating an application with Elm, whenever you build a thing with Elm, the only thing you really have to do is build the thing. And the only problem you really have to solve is the one you're interested in. Uh, so this completely changed how I experienced programming. I totally forget what the next slide says. 
Okay, I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> um, cool. Oh, geez. So, oh, got it. So for me, uh, let's, let's tie it back into that analogy. And the way that glasses are a tool to change the way that you experience light um, that clarifies your vision, Elm for me has been a tool that changes the way I think about UI so that I can think about the thing that I set out to do. And so now, since I've been using Elm for, for nearly a year, I've built a bunch of open source projects that I like, really meant to build, that I really wanted to build, including one that I'm super proud of and that I'm really happy about maintaining and that people use in their own projects. Uh, I've built two running applications that, uh, that I use either every day or, or sometimes. Um, and of course, I get to stand up on this stage today and, and talk to all of you. And uh, from that confidence, I've been able to, to build on that and go out and found my own company. And I don't think that I would have been able to do any of these things if I was still working on fixing open source bugs related to that side project that I told you about. So that's my experience. And now I want to, to give you all something to think about for yourselves. So I have a, a call to action. So the first thing that I want to, want to ask for is for people with similar stories to mine to share them if you can. And I totally get that uh, for me to stand up on this stage and kind of declare to the programming world that sometimes I have a hard time concentrating on tasks requires like an immense amount of privilege. But if you don't feel safe or comfortable sharing your stories, I hope that there's somebody in your community that you can trust to, to share more anonymously and get your experiences out there in some way so that people can, can learn about the tools that you're using that have changed your experience and made you feel happy and productive in your work. And then the second thing I want to I wanna ask for is that for people who are building tools to, to listen to those stories, uh, I'm pretty sure that, that Elm wasn't designed, and Evan can clarify this, uh, Elm wasn't designed so that Luke Westby could have an easier time building user interfaces. Um, but it ended up working that way. So imagine if we listened to, to people telling these kind of stories, and then we went out and we built tools specifically with these types of people, with these ways of thinking in mind. Um, I think what we'll find is that, first of all, we'll have lots of really wonderful and intelligence and productive people join our communities around these tools. Uh, people that might not have felt comfortable, might not have felt that they fit in with the thing that they're currently using, and now they have something that they are welcome to use and uh, feel like they were thought about. And uh, as a result of doing that, I think we'll also find that the things that we build, if we target accessibility specifically, is that the experience is just nicer for everyone. So when we're thinking about building compilers as assistants, maybe we can also think about building them as therapists and welcoming in people who think and experience life way differently than the average person, the average programmer, and we'll have better communities as a result. Thank you.